Theology of the Cross, a thorough analysis of Martin Luther's theology. Summary. The great characters in history always transcend their time. Martin Luther is no exception to this rule. This work aims to describe the life, theology and work of this character who forever marked the history of Christianity. From a biographical reading of the life of the Augustinian friar, it will be possible to see a man who wanted to be a witness to Jesus Christ. He wanted to be a witness to Christ, the revelation of God on the cross. On this cross, God's judgment and his wonderful grace are manifested. In this cross, the present God is manifested, who seeks human beings in the midst of the greatest humiliation, sin and pain. Luther's theology will also be presented, which established a new theological paradigm from the 16th century onwards. His theology, which had strong contributions from the Pauline letters, deals with the dimension of the cross as a central point, both of spirituality and theological reflection. This cross represents the cross of Christ, where true theology and true knowledge of God are found. Finally, a reinterpretation of Luther will be presented from Lutheran theology, using a reading of the principles of liberation theology. Through some of his writings, Luther had the courage to face the powerful ecclesiastical machine of his time, certainly at the risk of his life. To free his people from captivity or at least to have laid the theoretical basis for liberation from internal captivity. Ecclesial that distorts the face of the church and impedes Christian freedom. Introduction. This work has undergone some changes throughout its development. Initially, it was thought to simply analyze the development of Luther's theology of the cross without applications to the present day. It was thought to address the issue of the theology of the cross more in its historical development, its origin, criticism and influences in the 16th century. However, during the research, it was possible to perceive a relationship between the cross of Christ, Luther's theology, and the crucified people, who are part of the concern addressed by liberation theology. Looking for books that address the cross of Christ, where God reveals himself, and the crucified, where God is present, the author came across the book, Luther and Liberation, edited by Walter Altman, a book that, due to its title, aroused immense curiosity and showed a clear relationship between Luther's theological thought and liberation theology, thus enabling the development of this work, Theology of the Cross, a rereading of Luther's theology in a Latin American perspective. It was from the observation between Luther and liberation that a reinterpretation of the theology of the cross from a Latin American perspective was understood. For this purpose, three fundamental points were discussed. They are, presentation of Martin Luther, the theology of Martin Luther, and rereadings of Martin Luther. Firstly, an analysis of the historical context that involved the entire 16th century was made. It is known that all theology is the result of the context in which it developed. And to understand the main subject of the monograph, which is the theology of the Augustinian monk, it is not possible to ignore the world that surrounded him and the historical landmarks of his time. An approach was made to the formation process of the Holy Roman German Empire with the aim of investigating the political social context. At the beginning of the 16th century, Germany was nothing more than a divided and anarchic territory, in which the imperial heritage remained, although weakened. At the end of the 15th century, the Holy Empire, formed in 962 by the Union of Germany, Italy and Burgundy, had lost the precision of its extension, due to the independence of territories that were part of it, and no longer represented a legitimate political reality. Europe in the 16th century was the consequence of previous centuries and the Germany that received Luther was a divided, decentralized Germany, in a feudal system of government and politics, since it did not have a sovereign and central authority, capable of representing the entire territory and the entire German population, 
The cultural context was a period rich in cultural facts, marked by the revival of man's capabilities and a new awakening of awareness of himself and the universe. This period was also known for the Renaissance humanism movement. This movement, which, with its ideology and development in society, emerged with proposals contrary to the church's tradition on the spiritual and civil life of man in the Middle Ages. The Renaissance mentality reflected the development of a new era, characterized by individualism and rationalism and at the same time allowed the development of a critical sense, unthinkable until then. Determining a set of criticisms of the behavior and authority of the clergy, reason began to be part of man's life. Both the political, social and cultural factors are directly linked to the religious factor. The religious context is able to show that the Catholic Church, which has always played a role of great relevance and influence on the European continent, with greater intensity in the period corresponding to the Middle Ages, had transformed into a church lost in its distorted values in search of power and riches. The corruption of popes and bishops in the Middle Ages contributed to the decline of the authority and prestige of the Church. Criticism and discontent with the Catholic Church and its abusive actions grew greatly among the people and secular authorities. Still concerning the presentation of Martin Luther, a brief biography of the Reformer will be presented highlighting his childhood, the education received by his parents, followed by teachers, teachers and finally priests, and his training. We know that life and work do not have a dependent relationship, but knowing the character's life certainly helps in a better understanding of his work and his theological thought. It is worth noting that Luther's image of God was a consequence of his entire formation. This is the reason why our tour begins with a presentation about the life and world of Martin Luther. Through the historical and biographical context it will be possible to understand, Germany, at the dawn of the 16th century and a little more about Luther and his thoughts. Continuing, the author worked on the theology of Martin Luther. His theology, from the 16th century onwards, established a new theological paradigm. His theological views always came in response to some question raised in his context. Developing a theology of the cross was answering the questions of his time in light of the crucified one on the tree. Luther's theology boasted of the cross. Between God and man there is the cross of Christ, his life, his blood, his sufferings, which we must understand as ways of access to the divine world or as a way of access for the divine to our world of suffering and pain. Thus began the second chapter. Talking about the cross of Christ is not praising the believer's imitation of the suffering Christ. It is, rather, about describing God's action in search of suffering man. Paul was the pioneer in developing a theology of the cross and it was from this source that the reformer drank to develop his theological thinking regarding the crucified one. Pauline theology was born from a very concrete situation, linked to discussions in the community. If there had not been such problems, perhaps Paul would never have addressed the issue of the cross. After the Pauline contribution, closing this chapter, comes the Christological theme with the purpose of analyzing Luther's reading of Christ. It can be said that his reading is fundamentally soteriology. For him, Jesus Christ is never a theoretical question, but always a practical question. The more concentration on God's redeeming action,
the more liberating action. Finally, rereadings of Martin Luther closes this work. The author describes some of Luther's teachings, exposing the perspectives of his theology applied to our current Latin American times. The writing from the Babylonian captivity shows a theologian who thinks from the perspective of the German people. In this writing, Luther particularly criticized the papacy, which he accused of exercising an intolerable tyranny over souls, notably for its doctrine and practice of the sacraments. Soon after, the theme of the theology of the cross in the lives of the Latin American people is addressed, which shows the cross of Christ as the most visible sign that suffering and death can be overcome. The author concludes by developing a vision of liberation theology based on Lutheran theology, that is, Luther thought of the liberation of human thought as a principle of liberation for man as a whole. If it is possible to free thought, there will consequently be an integral liberation of man. Presentation of Martin Luther This chapter will describe the life and times of a character from the past who transcended his time, Martin Luther. Without a doubt, he played an important role in a historical period of transition in the transition from the medieval era to the modern era. A transition in all aspects, social, economic, political, cultural and religious. The historical context. To talk about the theology of the Augustinian monk Martin Luther, it is not possible to ignore his life and historical context. His theological work is directly intertwined with the remarkable historical facts of his time. Therefore, details of these facts are presented so that it is possible to obtain a more crystal clear understanding of his theological idea. Political Social Context Luther lived in a time full of wars and carried out his mission in an atmosphere of constant and strong tensions in foreign policy. At the dawn of the 16th century, a new political and social scenario presented itself within European Christianity. In several parts of Europe, Power was centralized in the hands of absolute monarchs and no longer in the empire, as it was at the beginning, in 962, at the birth of the Holy Empire, where it was directed by two great complementary forces, the supreme pontiff, with the religious authority, and the emperor, with political power. With the function of expanding the faith and defending the interests of the Church. The Germany of Luther's time did not exist as we know it today. It was part of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. The empire was made up of 350 entities, larger or smaller, territories, free cities, ecclesiastical principalities and had an elected emperor at its head. The reign of Emperor Charles roughly coincided with Luther's period of public activity. A direct descendant of the King of Spain, until then known as one of the most powerful nations in Europe, and also Lord of the Netherlands, he was elected to the throne of Germany at the end of the second decade of the 16th century. It is necessary, however, to remember that the, the title of emperor did not give him absolute authority over Germany. The emperor did not rule directly in any part of Germany, except in certain cities called free cities. At the time of the Reformation, Germany, which comprised the kingdom's lands up to the borders of Hungary and Poland, excluding Switzerland,
had not yet constituted itself as a unified nation directed by a strong central power, as in the case of England, France and Spain. The German Empire or Holy Roman Empire consisted of many separate territories, both large and small. Its rulers, who used various titles, such as Elector, Landgrave, Margrave, recognized the person of the emperor as the feudal lord of them all. However, each governed its own territory, almost with complete independence. At the dawn of the 16th century, while monarchies such as France, England and Spain were increasingly centralized and their power increased, the Holy Empire remained a very weak entity due to the power struggle between the Emperor and the Empire's institutions. While regional powers sought to secure their share of imperial power, the Emperor struggled to increase his power. The final result of the political disputes was the formation of a fragmented or multiple Germany. The Empire had a kind of central authority in Parliament comprising all the princes and great nobles, the men who held the lands as vassals of the Emperor. All decisions relating to the Empire as a whole were taken jointly between the Emperor and Parliament. This was grouped into three colleges, the seven prince electors, who elected the Emperor. The other secular princes and counts as well as the ecclesiastical authorities, and the cities of the empire numbering 65, whose power only grew from 1582. Particularly, in the first decades of the 16th century, two issues would attract Parliament's attention. The religious question, raised in 1521, with Luther's appearance before the Worms Parliament. And the Turkish danger, the most disturbing subject of Luther's time, and which undoubtedly most strongly determined the consciousness of men throughout Europe, was the rapid and dangerous advance of the Turks, under the command of Sultan Suleiman II, from east to west. The entire Balkan Peninsula was already occupied by the Turks. During the entire period of the Reformation, there was a fierce fight for Hungary. Through the Battle of Mohács in 1526, the independent Hungarian kingdom was extinguished, and Habsburg, with Fernando I, took possession, although only partially, of Hungary. In 1529 the Turks were at the gates of Vienna. Parallel to the fighting with the Turks on land, there was a confrontation in the Mediterranean Sea with alternating victories, Tunis 1535, and defeats, Algiers 1541. There was a serious possibility that the Turks would penetrate deep into Germany. The Turkish danger was an issue that directly affected the entire empire, from a military and financial point of view. The conjunction between religious division and the Turkish threat is one of the striking political facts of the time. Almost every event in the history of the German Reformation, initiated by Martin, is linked to an event on the European war stage. Europe in this period suffered not only from war between nation-states, or between monarchies, but also fought against death and hunger, cold and heat, fleas, scabies and many other worms and pests that terrorized the entire territory. Carter Lindbergh says that sin Death and the devil loomed large and threateningly on the scene of late medieval life and mentality. 16th century Europe was the consequence of previous centuries of agricultural crises, acute famine, and the great plague of the mid-14th century. During the period of the Reformation, 
The plague no longer raged as in previous years, but it still represented a real danger. The Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli almost succumbed to it, and in 1527 the plague reached the region where Luther lived. In Wittenberg those who could escape fled, the others died or received care in Luther's house which he transformed into a kind of asylum for the sick and helpless. As if natural disasters were not enough, Luther's time was also marked by the fall of the human community into its own plague. Represented by wars and peasant revolts. Peasant revolts also caused much destruction and caused impediments to social economic life. Most people in the 16th century were peasants who toiled in the fields from sunrise to sunset or day laborers who were at the mercy of urban entrepreneurs. His working life found occasional relief in the festivities of the most important holy days and in the ritual pauses on the occasion of weddings and funerals. In some areas, the peasant was practically a slave, in other areas, a small rural owner. The peasant's life was difficult, the upper class often portrayed the peasant as stupid, rude, disgusting, untrustworthy and prone to violence. Naturally, for the nobles, these descriptions marked by self-interest only rationalized and legitimized the oppression of the peasants. The entire political social context of the German nation in the late medieval era, where its main centers were infected by the loss of moral direction, distrust, depersonalization and social fragmentation resulting from selfish political interests in open competition, helps us understand the enthusiastic reception of Luther's early writings that attacked ecclesiastical authority and extolled Christian freedom. Cultural Context In the 14th to 16th centuries, the West was experiencing a period of great change, especially at a cultural and mental level, as a new vision of the world and of man himself was emerging. It was a period rich in cultural facts, marked by the revival of man's capabilities and a new awakening of awareness of himself and the universe. Leinhard states that one would not adequately describe the intellectual and cultural effort at the beginning of the 16th century if one stopped talking about humanism, or the Renaissance. Martin Dreher, on the Renaissance and humanism, says that it is difficult to separate them. They are often used interchangeably, even though they present the same phenomenon from different perspectives. In reality, the Renaissance and humanism are two moments that are interconnected by a single movement, which displayed the image of the divine world expressed in human terms. Reason begins to gain space, and according to Renaissance thinking, it was a manifestation of the human spirit that placed the individual closer to God. By exercising his ability to question the world, man simply gave vent to a gift granted by God. The focus had now turned to human beings, nature, natural sciences, and historical research. Renaissance humanism began in the second half of the 14th century in Italy. It reached its best expression and spread throughout Europe during the 15th and 16th centuries. All nations had their part in the Renaissance, but Italy was ahead of them all. Having been the source from which other countries sought life, Germany and England drew the same inspiration from the same source, and in each land, shaped by the qualities inherent in each. The Renaissance took a particular form. This movement in Western Europe meant, mainly, two things, emancipation and expression. Renaissance is a vague term that has served to cover many facts. The revival of scholarship, the renewal of art, the revolt against the scholastics, the expansion of men's thought and the expansion of the world beyond the seas. The death of feudalism had provided freedom of action for individuals and weakened authority. The famous capture of Constantinople by the Turks in 1453, which put an end to the Greek Empire, dispersed its wise men throughout the world and caused a glorious load of manuscripts and sculptures, the result of looting, to sail west towards Italy. The invention of the press, with the consequent movement of books and thought, produced a considerable change, 
while the discovery of America, with its obvious effects on commerce, profoundly modified the laws of supply and transport possibilities. Here we come across the second great element of the Renaissance, expression. Expression implies awareness of what is expressed. In the Middle Ages, expression in words, or stone, or painting was simple, a matter of narrative and symbols, regulated mainly by tradition. But as people became more aware of themselves in the world, and began to desire to define their relationships to it, emotion flared and expression was sought and found. First, in Italy and then in other lands, a consummate passion for language emerged. The exhumation of manuscripts in remote and forgotten monasteries, the publication of the works of Virgil and Seneca, Plato and Aristotle, together with a host of ancient authors, influenced the imagination of men. This emancipation and the power of expression manifested itself in all directions. In fact, a tool that contributed to both emancipation and the power of expression was the emergence of the press. In the second half of the 15th century, the spread of humanism would be considerably favored by the invention of the press, by multiplying the editions of texts. It was at this time that the movement embraced Germany. But it was not through universities, but through the exchange of correspondence through circles of clergy and lay people established in numerous cities. At a time when the dissemination of literature depended on manuscript copyists, even if there were hundreds of them, ideas were doomed to remain in the possession of the minority. After the invention of the press, an effective process of creating books for students began, gradually breaking with the intellectual monopoly of the clergy and the oral transmission of knowledge, which characterized the Middle Ages. Without the press, the progress of science would have been delayed. In Italy, the Renaissance had a great contribution to the formation of a nationalist spirit and led to the search for classical Latinity, thus creating a secular spirit similar to that which characterized classical Greece. In Germany, collaboration went further. There, not only were the classical authors of the Roman Greeks studied, but also the Hebrew language. Alongside Latin and Greek, Hebrew found its way to the university. Here too, humanism helped in the formation of a national spirit. Luther's cries in his writing to the Christian nobility of the German nation, from 1520, were heartily applauded by German humanists, who saw him as a companion in struggle. Although the Renaissance in Italy had humanist and pagan contours, the trends it generated were taken up in Northern Europe by humanists and Christian reformers and used by them to justify the study of the Bible in the original as the basic document of the Christian faith. We could think that in Luther's life the contribution of the phenomenon of Renaissance humanism, which powerfully modified the entire intellectual life of the German nation, was located, above all, on a technical level, the learning of ancient languages, the interest in sources, in particular through biblical texts, musical training. However, in trying to overcome the Middle Ages, the Renaissance and humanism helped prepare the ground for the emergence of a theological seed, Luther's theology. From 1520 onwards, some of Luther's writings would show his involvement in this cultural context. Religious Context both the political, social and cultural factors are closely related to the religious in the historical context of the 16th century. The medieval system had been marked by great cohesion, which it maintained for a long period, many centuries. It was ordered from top to bottom, from God to the world, society and humanity. The church constituted an intermediary and interpreter authorized by divine right. Religion was intertwined in many ways in the game of political forces and any issue that involved society. In a social context of Christianity, necessarily involved the church. Religion has had several faces during its history. This is especially true of the Western world, particularly Christianity. In pre-modernity, religion permeated the entire life of societies.
The modern separation between religion and the secular world was unknown. At the time, there was the concept of Corpus Christianum, Christian political community, that is, religion and secular life were not conceived as separate. Everyday life was permeated with religious meaning. It was updated. Within the church, for example, members were not exactly known as we understand them today. The church was a thing for the king, emperor and, for that reason alone, for the people. The concept of conversion was not known, at least not as it is today, as there was no alternative way of life outside the church. Due to the Inquisition, life was only possible within the church. Outside of it, one was a heretic, and a heretic paid with the price of his own life. That's why religion was the air you breathed, the water you drank. A person is born, lives and dies in religion. Baptism, marriage, burial were rules. In this context, death and judgment, heaven and hell, purgatory and paradise were part of everyday life. The church had assumed a structure fully identified with secular government systems. And due to its strong political and economic structure, it was the largest feudal landowner. Ecclesiastical positions were negotiated according to economic and political interests, with constant disputes over power and accumulation of wealth. As this wealth grew, the high clergy, made up of those who held higher positions in the church's internal hierarchy, distanced themselves from religious matters. If there was no concern, on the part of the church, with the religious spirit or with the healing of souls afflicted with fear of death, there was great concern regarding money. The Roman Curia sought by all means to cover its expenses. To this end, he created a system of fees, taxes, donations and penances. The lack of money was constant due to spending on the court, construction or military expenses, resulting from the constant wars. To the peculiar political, social, economic and religious conditions in the Holy Roman Empire must be added the peculiar situation of the papacy between 1492 and 1520. Since the three popes who reigned in this period are considered among the three most corrupt in the history of the Church, except the pontificate of Pius III, Francesco Todescini Piccolomini, of just 26 days, in 1503, between Alexander VI and Julius II. Worldliness and the dissolution of customs had deeply taken hold of the ecclesiastical body. Since the last centuries of the Middle Ages there had been a deep desire for a transformation, in the head and members, of the Church. That is, a radical and broad change. The ecclesiastical institution was not called into question as such. It is true, the fact that there were abuses was recognized to a greater or lesser extent, but the church itself was not rejected. At the dawn of the 16th century the demand for a purified church had become stronger. With increasing irritation, the gap between the real church and the church intended by Christ was perceived. Various ecclesiastical, monastic and lay movements, including Renaissance humanism with Erasmus of Rotterdam, sought to reinvigorate the church, free it from all signs of decadence, purify it from abuse, and detach it from economic interests and political power. Erasmus of Rotterdam writes, Popes call themselves vicars of Jesus Christ. But if they sought to conform to the life of God their master, if they patiently suffered their sufferings and their cross, showing the same contempt for the world. If they seriously reflected on the beautiful name of Pope, that is, of Father, and on the most holy epithet with which they are named, who would be more unhappy than they? Who would want to buy, with all their assets, this eminent position, or who, once elevated to it, would want, to support themselves in it, to use the sword, poisons and all kinds of violence? There! How many goods they would lose if wisdom took hold of their minds for an instant! The wisdom? It would be enough if they had just a little grain of that salt that the Savior speaks of. They would then lose those immense riches, those divine honors, that vast domain, that fat patrimony, 
those magnificent victories, all those positions, those dignities and those offices in which they participate, all those taxes that they perceive, whether in their own states or in those of others. The fruit of all those favors and all those indulgences, with which they traffic so advantageously, that numerous court of horses, of mules, of servants, those delights and those pleasures that they continually enjoy. Observe, observe how many things would need to be lost, since this is just a leftover from pontifical happiness. All these goods would soon be followed by vigils, fasting, tears, prayers, sermons, meditations, sighs and a thousand other works of a similar nature. While the church was concerned with wealth and power, the people were concerned with the issue of salvation. Religiosity in Luther's time was intense. The faithful participated in religious practices of all types, such as processions, pilgrimages, devotions, visits to exhibitions of saints' relics, all with the aim of ensuring their salvation. The fear of hell and, perhaps even more so, of purgatory was enormous. The church came to meet these anxieties by selling indulgences, not to calm afflicted souls, but to benefit, once again, itself. Indulgence is related to the sacrament of penance. In penance, the sinner's repentance, confession in the presence of a priest, absolution and imposed satisfaction were expected. In satisfaction, the sinner must make reparation or atonement because of the punishment that the sin entailed. It was a common opinion that sin not only entailed guilt, but also punishment. This punishment should be assumed here on earth or atoned for in purgatory. The practice of selling indulgences was a good way for the Catholic Church to finance its projects. In addition to maintaining the papal state, indulgences were of great importance from a financial aspect. The curia and the papal state depended largely on the income obtained from their sales. Many projects were financed through the publication of indulgences. In the economic field, it can be said that they had the same function as loans later on. On the other hand, for the faithful, the indulgence was an opportunity to protect themselves from purgatory and eternal judgment, and, the desire for salvation found among the people meets the financial needs of the curia. It was preached and believed that a person, by purchasing an indulgence, could free themselves from the punishments of purgatory. During this period, a rich and lively religiosity flourished. Although often superficial, without clear guidance and direction. There was, however, yet another path, in the last centuries of the Middle Ages. By which the re-establishment of religious truth was sought. It was a movement of personal piety, namely, mysticism. The preferred instruments of this movement were prayer and meditation. With the aim of achieving intimate personal union with the Savior, focused on people's desires. This current left significant influences on Luther. One of the movements of personal piety was expressly called, modern devotion. This movement wanted to revive the piety of the first Christian community. The first monks, of the, desert fathers, and the fathers of the church. As a student, Luther attended for some time the house of one of the currents of modern devotion, the Brothers of Common Life. Luther attended, in Magdeburg, one of the schools maintained by the Brothers of Common Life, adherents of the Devotio Moderna. The brothers praised the imitation of Jesus Christ and humility. The examination of conscience and fraternal censorship, the reading of the Bible and prayer, without neglecting, on the other hand, the transmission of knowledge, stimulated by certain contacts with humanistic means. Modern devotion shows that in the church of the time there were not only things that deserved criticism, changes and reformulations. There were also groups with a deeper understanding of the Christian faith. A brief biography. Martin Luther is one of the great characters who profoundly marked the course of modern Western history. He shook the medieval foundations of his time and opened new horizons to his contemporaries. Luther's influence was not restricted to the life of faith, 
but extended to sectors such as education, politics, economics and others. Naturally, many details of Martin Luther's life are known. Therefore, we will try to describe some events that directly mark the formation of his theological thought. Knowing that understanding his life helps in understanding his work. Eilben, November 1483. Martin Luther, whose name in German is Martin Luther or Luther, was born on November 10, 1483. In the city of Eilben, state of Thuringia, Germany. He died in the same city on a journey on February 18, 1546. A few days after his birth, as usual, he was taken to church and baptized in. In evocation of the saint of the day 25, he received the name Martin Ho. Luther's family had its roots in the common people of the city. His father, Hans Luther, was a very rude man of peasant origin who, little by little, acquired a certain well-being through his work in mining. His mother, Margaretha Lindemann Luther was a very simple and humble woman. Luther suffered greatly from the extreme severity of his parents. They believed in flogging as a way of administering justice. The strictness with which his parents treated them greatly influenced his association with God. The picture of divinity that his parents transmitted to him reflected his own character. A harsh father and severe judge, demanding a joyless virtue, asking for constant reparation. Possibly, his habitual adolescence experiences painted an image of a cruel God. The conception of God that had been instilled in him contained almost no element of tenderness. Jesus was not the loving son, he was the Jesus of the last judgment. The Christ who threatened sinners with eternal fire. The period Luther went through schools also received an education similar to that received at home, namely, characterized by physical punishment. In one morning the merciless master has elected him fifteen times because he did not know a lesson that had not been taught to him. At thirteen he was transferred from Mansfeld, where there were many whip and catechism to Magdeburg at 14, to the school of St. George in Eisenach. First the parents, and now the schools contributed to the formation of a great theologian. In 1501 his father, already having some financial resource, sent him to the University of Erfurt, founded in 1379, one of the most respected German universities of the time. But, as a precondition for enrollment in one of the three superior faculties, theology, medicine and law, it was necessary to attend a period of four years to the faculty of artists. Before joining normal university education, with a view to the study of law, theology or medicine, each young man had to first study the cycle of studies of liberal arts. In liberal arts, grammar, logic, astronomy, metaphysics and music were studied. The reclined life on boarding school allowed Luther to complete his studies within a very short time. In February 1505, he received the enviable title of Master of Arts. Hans, who had scheduled his studies and dreamed of a jurist son, referred him to law school, which began in 1505. Suddenly, after two months of course, and to his father's disgust, the young man 22 years decided to be a monk. The withdrawal of the course was motivated by a vote that Luther had made a few days earlier. Terrified by a storm on Mansfeld's travel to Erfurt. A month after the beginning of his studies, Martin Ho traveled to Mansfeld. On the way back, on July 2, 1505, he was involved in a thunderstorm. A lightning fell nearby and caused such fear of his person, who, invoking the patron saint of the miners and all needy, made the promise of joining one convent. Help, Santa Anna. I want to become a monk. What happened for Luther to make this decision so quickly? The fear of death. One of his friends had tragically died. And now Luther himself has experienced the fear of death closely. Luther did not enter the convent because he had no other way to advance in life, but his decision was properly religious. Religious experience.
These two events accelerated Martin Luther's decision for convent life. In July 1505, the young man fulfilled his word and joined the convent of the Herets of St. Augustine, or Augustinian, in Erfurt. In the convent, the monastic rules were strictly observed by Martin. I was a godly monk, and watched the regulation of my order so strictly. If a monk ever entered the sky due to the life of the friar, then I should also come in. If I had lasted more time, it will be held tortured until he dies of wake, prayers, readings and other works. The Luther who entered the convent was a terrified person, tormented by the fear of hell, uncertainty about salvation. The then friar Martin Luther made the vows of poverty, chastity and obedience, and was ordered to priest in 1507. He began his theological studies with Johann Nathanem, an Occam disciple in Erfurt. After receiving an order from the Augustinian convent to teach theology, he reached the bachelor's degree in theology in 1509, soon after assumed the chair of a teacher of biblical interpretation. It was in the struggle with the Bible that Luther made a sensational discovery. The cause of his anguish and fears had already been assumed by Jesus on the cross. In 1510 Luther was sent to Rome in a delegation representing the order. The first reaction he had when visiting the city was that of godly fear. He proceeded, raised his hands, and shouted, Save! Sacred Rome! He fulfilled all the devotions of a pilgrim, was respectfully leaned against the sanctified relics, climbed the Santa Scala on his knees, visited the Roman Forum, but seems to be insensitive to the art of the Renaissance with which Raphael, Miguel Angelo and a hundred others they began to adorn the capital. However, the pagan form of life that the population and the clergy adopted did not go unnoticed by Luther. The dissolutionary customs of much of the population did not attest well as to the morals and religion of the inhabitants of the famous city, and, the German monk witnessed the lack of true religious feeling. In 1512 Luther received the title of doctor in theology. In 1515 he was appointed vicar of his order, having under his authority eleven monasteries. During this period he studied Greek and Hebrew to delve into the meaning and origin of the words used in scripture, knowledge he would soon use for his own translation. Slowly, from 1512 to 1517, their religious ideas moved away from the official doctrines of the church. He began to speak about our theology, as opposed to what was taught in Erfurt. In 1515 he attributed the corruption of the world to the clergy, who delivered to the people too many maxims and fables of human invention, and not the word of God's scriptures. In 1516 he discovered an anonymous German manuscript, whose mystical piety so supported his view that the soul was absolutely dependent on divine grace for its salvation that he edited and published it as Theologia Germanica or Deutsche Theologie. He reproached indulgence preachers for taking advantage of the simplicity of the poor. While preparing lectures on Paul's epistle to the Romans in his room in the university tower, he underwent a series of intellectual and spiritual experiences, which became known as the Tower Experience. These events occurred between 1513 and 1518. The young professor, newly appointed, was still struggling with the questions of God's grace and justice. How could the same God be both of these things? At the end of his life, Luther confessed that he felt reborn when the true meaning of Paul's words finally penetrated his mind and heart. Finally, by God's mercy, meditating day and night, I listened to the context of the words, the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel, from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Then, I began to understand that God's justice is that through which the righteous live by a gift from God, that is, by faith. And this is the meaning, the justice of God is revealed by the gospel, namely, the passive justice with which the merciful God justifies us by faith, as it is written, 
the just will live by faith. Here, I felt as if he was completely reborn and entered paradise through the open gates. There, a whole new facet of the Bible revealed itself to me. Luther's concept of God and salvation was revolutionized by his new interpretation of God's righteousness and the gospel of justification by grace through faith alone. From then on, Luther developed. In addition to the 95 theses, several other theses, such as, free will, original sin, confession, good works, sacraments in general, grace, contrition for sins, indulgences purgatory and primacy of the Pope, the theology of Martin Luther. From the 16th century onwards, Luther's theology established a new theological paradigm. This is the dimension of the cross as a central point, both of spirituality and theological reflection. Medieval theology, basically centered on the scholastic ideal, found itself questioned by the new order that was being installed in society. A new paradigm was being outlined within culture. It is in this context that Luther's theology emerges. This new theology will no longer meditate on the being of God. Theology is revelation. But this revelation is indirect revelation. This theology recognizes God not through works. But through the cross. His theology is the theology of the cross, one that does not recognize itself in glory, but in sufferings. The theology of the cross. Luther was not a systematic theologian and never produced a systematic theology. He was a dialectical thinker, meaning he reveled in the paradoxical nature of truth. As a theologian, the cross constitutes a central theme in his theology, which focuses on observation of the suffering of Christ and that of Christians. From the birth to the death of Christ, his entire existence was placed under the sign of the cross. Christ was killed, condemned by the world and descended into hell. His disciples had the same luck. They became like Christ. They were persecuted, despised. Luther, by defending a theology of the crucified, stands up against a theology that predominated in his time, the theology of glory, natural theology. This theology did not have the cross of Christ as a starting point for its arguments. The theologian of glory is the natural man, he is incurably religious, he hates the cross and suffering. And he seeks works and successes and, therefore, considers the knowledge of an eternally active, all-powerful God to be something glorious and uplifting. But the theologian of the cross, this is what he believes, comes to self-knowledge where he knows God in his despised humanity by giving human things the names of their true essences, and not by the images of their beautiful appearances. He does not call them for what they want out of the fear of not being, but calls them for what they want out of the fear of not being, but calls them as they are accepted by the unlimited suffering love of God. The theologian of glory, of the invisible essence of God, obtains for himself, in secret, space for activities of his own interest, which allow him to, love equals, because, his theology needs equalities and confirmations. But the theologian of the cross is transformed by the visible essence of God on the cross. For Luther, the theology of the cross is, above all, a practice, a way of doing theology. A disposition to do theology in accordance with the cross. His motto was, crux sola est mostra theologia, only the cross is our theology. The cross of Christ is not a mere object of theology, but the mark of all theology. It is not only part of the doctrine of vicarious satisfaction, but constitutes an integral part of all Christian knowledge. Therefore, theology of the cross is not a chapter of theology, but it is a certain way of doing theology. The cross of Christ there is important not only for the search for redemption and certainty of salvation, but it is the center of the perspective of all theological statements. It is as much a part of the doctrine about God as it is of the doctrine about the work of Christ. In this sense, Luther's theology wants to be theology of the cross.
He understands himself as a theologian of the cross, and in the Heidelberg debate, held in the spring of 1518, Luther defines the theologian, according to Theses 19, 20, 21 and 22, as follows. 19. One cannot properly call a theologian who sees the invisible things of God, understanding them through those that are made. 20. But those who understand the visible and subsequent things of God, seeing them through the sufferings and the cross. 21. The theologian of glory affirms that what is bad is good, and what is good is bad. The theologian of the cross says things as they are. 22. The wisdom that sees the invisible things of God, understanding them from works, becomes conceited, becomes completely blind and hardened. This means that there is a major inversion in the epistemological composition of theology. Theology is no longer done seeking through reasoning to prove the existence of God. But God is known from the cross and suffering. It is under the sign of the cross that God reveals himself and approaches human beings, says Luther. God acts with his saints in a senseless and appalling way. Why? So that we do not follow our own thoughts or the advice of humans. But that we intend to look for Christ in what he reveals from the Father and that we stick simply and solely to the word of the gospel that shows us Christ well and makes him known to us. The Augustinian theologian was not devaluing reason as such, but he highlighted the antagonism between the God of the theology of the cross and the conceptions that human beings have of God. In fact, he does not want to see God, except in his majesty. This acts on weakness to destroy this tendency. As has been said, Luther does not exclude the natural knowledge of God. On the contrary, there is a double knowledge of God, the general and the particular. Every man has general knowledge, namely, that God exists, that he created heaven and earth, that he is just, that he punishes the wicked, etc. But what God thinks of us, what he wants to give and do to free us from sin and death and save us, which is God's private and true knowledge, man does not know. So it can happen that someone's face is familiar to me, but I don't really know him, because I don't know what he has in his mind. Thus it is that men know, naturally, that there is a God. But they do not know what he wants and what he does not want. While in the late Middle Ages, theology of the cross was an expression of the mystique of suffering. Luther used it strictly as a new theological principle of knowledge. According to Protestant theologian Jürgen Moltmann, the cross for Luther is the revelation of God's being to human beings in their context. For him, the cross is not a symbol for the path from suffering to communion with God. A turning point from the path of works to God's benevolence, but it is the visible revelation of God's being to man, in the reality of his world. Like the cross of the rejected and abandoned Christ. At the Heidelberg debate on April 26, 1518, Luther expounded his new theological principle of knowledge during an exegesis of Psalm chapter 22. The theology of the cross was the highlight of his reformatory decision. Luther does not see the cross of Christ in a mystical way, but as God's protest against the misuse of his name. For the purposes of religious crowning of human wisdom, of the Christian empire, of medieval ecclesiastical society, and for the freedom of faith. God's protest against evil occurs in the natural culmination of the practice carried out by Jesus, the crucified one. His passion cannot be separated from his earthly life, from his teaching. He was condemned not because of a misunderstanding, but because of his daily, historical attitude. He preferred to die freely rather than renounce truth, justice, and law. The case mounted against Jesus has not only religious connotations, but political ones as well. With theology crucis, the reformatory struggle for the true or false church begins. For the liberation of man enslaved under the obsession of works and productivity and, therefore, for a new relationship with reality itself. Pauline contribution to the development of the theology of the cross.
To speak of a theology of the cross without making reference to Pauline writings would, at the very least, impoverish it from the great richness that it can offer us. Paul was the pioneer in developing a theology of the cross and making it a reason to boast. Paul's theological work has two main phases. In the first, Paul is dominated by the theme of the resurrection. Witness to this are his first two letters to the Thessalonians. Written in the year 49, almost 20 years after his conversion. The resurrection of Christ raised the hope of resurrection for everyone. The second is a theological turn where emphasis is placed on a theology of the cross or a theology of the crucified Christ. This is based on 1st and 2nd Corinthians. In 1st Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2 it says, For I determined among you not to know anything except Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Evidently the theme of the resurrection is not abandoned. But the Apostle is forced to develop a theology of the cross as a response to the problems that arose in his community. And which ended up being a source for the elaboration of the theology of Friar Martin Luther, almost a century and a half ago. Half after. The development of Paul's theology of the cross. Pauline theology was born from a very concrete situation, linked to discussions in the community. If there had not been such problems, perhaps Paul would never have discussed the issue of the cross. It is therefore not a theme in itself. The main theme is the resurrection that inaugurated the newness of the world. It will always constitute the core of Pauline theology. Because he only recognized the resurrected one. And his theological work, in essence, comes down to translating to the world the latent meaning of what resurrection means. Draw from this all the consequences, in relation to the past, with the abandonment of Judaism, in relation to the future, with the inauguration of the new man, the new heaven and the new earth. Whenever he talks about the death of Christ, it is in correlation with the resurrection. He who was killed has been resurrected and lives. But its background is death. Only with this background does it make sense to talk about resurrection. Otherwise it would be Greek mythology. There would be nothing new. Therefore, sooner or later, this issue of the cross would emerge in the theological elaboration. But specifically, it was motivated by some distortions that occurred in the communities of Corinth. In this confrontation between Paul and his theological enemies, the meaning he gave to the death of Christ appears. It is in this context that Paul develops a theology of the cross. In the first epistle to the Corinthians, Paul meets little theologians, people who converted to the faith through Paul's preaching, but who distorted their theological intuitions. They said, there will be no more resurrection. We are now resurrected. The reception of Numa in baptism was represented in such a concrete way that they considered themselves already resurrected and all pneumatic. They documented the possession of the spirit of resurrection with spiritual charismas and wisdom, glossolalia and ecstasies. Those who possessed the charisma boasted. They lived in an almost fanatical enthusiasm. They were called, psychic, spiritual, and were distinguished from the carnal or immature. The spiritual ones imagined themselves already in plenitude and in the resurrection. That is why they are already wise, they boast and offend others who are less spiritual or even carnal. They think they are perfect. They do not believe in a future resurrection, because it has already happened. Furthermore, for converted Roman and Greek citizens, Adhering to the crucified Jesus was a real scandal. It would be equivalent to the veneration and adoration of someone sentenced to the gas chamber for serious attacks on humanity. From then on, this Christian no longer cares about the earthly, crucified Jesus. They are only interested in the resurrected one and even curse Jesus according to the flesh. In the name of the resurrection that had already taken place, they postulated full freedom. Everything was allowed to them. It is no wonder that they considered morality to be already outdated.
Children could sleep with their own mother, they frequented prostitutes, participated in pagan sacrifices and ate sacrificed meat. They passed over others who were weaker than they did over Jesus himself, weak and crucified. The distortions present in the communities were responded to with a devastating argument. Refuting point by point, in the light of a theology of the cross and the crucified Christ. The cross denounces this braggadocio, unmasks this demonstration of self-power and pharisaic perfection. The cross shows what all the goodness in the world is, madness and dung. If the world could be saved, if the wisdom of the Greeks could redeem men and if the Jewish law with its miracles could liberate, the cross would be totally unnecessary. But if there was a cross, this betrays the failure of all Greek wisdom and all Jewish holiness. It's madness and scandal. There is only one wisdom, that of the cross. Greek and Jewish wisdom is a lie and leads to nothing. Leads to what it led to in the community. Inversion of all values and amorality and discrimination of one group over another. With the theme of the cross, Paolo shatters the illusions of enthusiasts and confronts them with the realities of the present time. Hope in the resurrection does not transport anyone to the future world, it is necessary to live hope in the present reality, where sin prevails, hence the duty of prudence, of humble following of the cross, of renunciation, of care for others and of love for everyone, weak and strong. Living the cross like this is, in truth, experiencing wisdom from God. The cross of Christ has become the critical measure to measure Christian wisdom which is like the love that bears everything, forgives everything, believes everything, hopes everything, excuses everything. He is not boastful, he is not arrogant, he is not irritable, he does not hold a grudge, he is a benign patient and enjoys the truth. On the cross the truth of Christian thinking as well as the concrete behavior of the Christian is decided. On the cross, spirits and practices are discerned. There are no middle terms on the cross. It is the watershed that defines God's paths. The cross forces us to accept another wisdom, that of God, which is not presented in a grandiose way, but with the capacity to take on daily activities and weaknesses. Whoever, like the Corinthian enthusiasts, despises the weak and those who are still on the path of the Spirit, must also despise the crucified one and curse him as in fact they did. But they forget that it was in this weakness that God revealed strength and salvation. Because the Lord in the world was weak, he compromised with others and gave his life to others, bringing them out of isolation and helplessness. He did not walk the path of freedom for others, but of freedom for others. That's why he walked the path of love until the end. Consequently, in this weakness of those who could do nothing, a strength that is characteristic of love was manifested. To win hearts and introduce a true saving revolution. In an understanding of the Pauline contribution to Luther's theology of the cross, it can be stated that the resurrection should not be dissociated from the cross, in order not to be trivialized in its meaning. On the contrary, it must be maintained with absolute coherence. The resurrection takes place amidst the experience of the cross. Finding hope in the midst of a desperate situation, having hope there, is an experience of resurrection in May to the reality of the cross. The resurrection always occurs in the midst of situations of harm, alienation, and the cross. In times of darkness, of the most violent repression, hope, mobilization and the possibility of an alternative are born. Without the cross, the reality of the resurrection would be empty of meaning. Hence Paul's commitment to defending the cross as the substance of the Christian faith, we know that what was stated here is not everything that Paul wrote about the cross and the crucified. We could still highlight many things, but we believe that this is enough to understand the development of Paul's theology of the cross. Christological Thematic How to Understand the Theology of the Cross and the Redemptive Work of Christ According to Luther, 
and what does it mean for us today, in our specific context? How did Luther see Jesus Christ? The Crucified? The Christology of the Augustinian friar formed his theology. The figure of Christ on the cross was a way for him to elaborate the theology of the cross. Luther lived exactly at the beginning of the conquest and colonization of current Latin America by the Spanish and Portuguese. According to Altman, if we look at the history of research and images of Jesus over these centuries, we will see how differently the issues emerge in Central Europe and Latin America. As seen in the second chapter of this work, Presentation of Martin Luther, it was exactly in a time of profound transition that Luther lived. Feudalism gave way to the first forms of mercantile capitalism. The process of formation of absolute territorial and national states was underway, independent of ecclesiastical or papal tutelage. Medieval culture, focused on God, was drowned out by Renaissance culture, which, even when religious, focused on the values, beauty and potential of the human being. Research in Central Europe. In Luther's Christology we do not find the dissociation between what later came to be called, in European research, the Christological dogma and the historical Jesus. In Luther, these still coincided. Naturally. It was from the Enlightenment, at the end of the 18th century, that many researchers sought to reconstruct the life of Jesus. With the intention that this reconstruction regarding the historical Jesus would free people who were shackled by the Church with its Christological dogmas. There was a real presumed contradiction between the historical Jesus and the Christological dogma. Research from the 16th century in Central Europe is, in this respect, simultaneously fascinating and tragic. Numerous discoveries were recorded regarding biblical texts, in the Gospels in particular, and characteristics of Jesus' actions and preaching. Hidden by theology until then, also stood out. However, in its aim of reconstructing the life of Jesus this new research was a failure. Albert Schweitzer, one of the most representative figures of liberal theology, brilliantly showed in his monumental history of research into the life of Jesus, that there were as many historical Jesuses as there were researchers, and the images drawn ranged from a social revolutionary Jesus to an imposter Jesus and head of a secret society, not even passing off as a romantic loving Jesus. Schweitzer still confesses, concluding his work on the history of research into the life of Jesus, saying, It is interesting to see what the fate of Leben Jesu Forschung was. It had arisen from the desire to find the Jesus of history and believed that it could relate him to our time, just as he is. That is, as master and salvation. She untied the bonds by which, for centuries, he had been tied to the rock of the church's magisterium and rejoiced when she realized that his figure regained life and movement, when she saw the historical man Jesus come to meet her. But this Jesus did not remain there, motionless, rather, surpassing our time, he returned to his. It was precisely this that surprised and amazed the theology of recent decades. The impossibility of holding him in our time, despite all the speculations and efforts, ignoring which he continued to escape. Excluding the data of faith from research on Jesus compromised the authentic story of Jesus itself. This type of research aimed to replace the image, considered false, of ecclesial faith, with another considered authentic, of historical research, which aimed, in fact, to replace the orthodox image of Christ with that of a Jesus in accordance with historical rationalist assumptions of liberal theology. Who was the real Jesus? European theological research in the 20th century came to emphasize that the true historical Jesus is the preached Christ of faith. It was highlighted that the evangelical pericopes are not, in essence, historical reports, but charismatic texts, that is, proclamations of the good news of salvation in Christ. In other words, 
The awareness of the difference between the historical Jesus and the proclaimed Christ ended up being positively incorporated into theology. It has only been asserted, contrary to the previous century, that it is not possible to reconstruct the life of Jesus and that what, strictly speaking, matters is only the Christ proclaimed and received in faith. European theology, in the second half of the 20th century, began to rediscover the value of the historical Jesus, now no longer as a biographical reconstruction, but as an expression that the Christ confessed and preached is no different from the one who lived and died, with certain identifiable peculiarities and under specific historical circumstances. Research in Latin America Throughout the history of the colonization of this continent, Two images of Jesus crystallized above others, a dead Jesus and a heavenly monarch Jesus. The first image is, to a large extent, a reflection of the popular experience under secular Arab and Mohammedan domination. Jesus suffers for the people, but he is defenseless, powerless and defeated. The image of the dead Christ is carried in processions and ardently venerated. The people identify with Christ's suffering and his shed blood, although they are not mobilized for the task of transforming their suffering situation. On the other hand, we have the image of Jesus as a celestial monarch, that is. Jesus is seen in the image of the King, of Spain or Portugal. His glory and his power, however, are transferred to heaven. As the King on earth, said so Jesus reigns in heaven. The power glory and wealth of Jesus are not instruments for changing unjust realities, they are not agents, but rather attributes of quality, which serve as an ideological legitimizer of the dominant power of the Spanish or Portuguese crown, specifically on earth. However, it is possible to find a positive side to these images. On the one hand, we still manage to connect the image of Jesus as a heavenly monarch, although in a radically distorted way, with the legitimate and indispensable memory of Christ's Lordship. In the case of the dead Jesus, we cannot deny that in centuries of oppression, often with no immediate way out for the oppressed, the image of the dead Christ has been important for the indispensable survival of critical consciousness. This is, in the most literal sense, passive resistance. The weak and dead Jesus must be seen as a victim of evil and injustice, which he stood up completely against. It is true that the combination of the two images has played a particularly harmful role throughout the history of Latin America. When, on the one hand, the power of Jesus is transferred to heaven. In the image of the effective earthly power of the king, and, on the other, a defeated Jesus is left for the identification and devotion of the oppressed people, the result is, evidently, the support of systems of domination. The task of rescuing the revolutionary power of these images remains, the dead Jesus, as an expression of Jesus' solidarity with those who suffer, and the heavenly monarch, as Jesus' full lordship over any and all other powers. Of course, in this process the images themselves will undergo transformations, to express the historical experience of liberation through death to a new life. The return to the historical Jesus can be a theological instrument to rediscover Jesus' active identification with the poor, the weak, the marginalized and the needy, and not just his acceptance and remission of their sins. Remembrance of the historical Jesus can be an expression of the process of leaving passivity for liberating action. Christology in Luther Luther did not have the modern awareness of a distinction between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith. Fundamentally, both were coincident. According to Altman, Martin Luther could naturally narrate the life of Jesus found in the evangelical accounts. Altman further says, with equal ease he could transport them to his own reality. Always highlighting Jesus who justifies by grace, through faith. In fact, if we impose on Luther the modern distinction between the Christ of faith and the historical Jesus,
He would certainly have preferred confession about Christ's current action, in favor of people, rather than narrating past events. Luther favored the Gospel of John, with Jesus' extensive speeches. Over the Synoptic Gospels, with their many accounts of the actions in Jesus' life, Luther's criticism is about faith stuck in the past without experiencing the actuality of Christ's work. In other words, his Christology is centered on a living Christ who is favorable to the present reality. Martin Luther suspected that Jesus had been left behind in the very distant past, and that the Church had taken his place in the present. Institutional interests thus overrode the proclamation of the Gospel. Instead of being an instrumental and disinterested spokesperson for Christ's message of current free salvation, the church institution took the place of Christ himself. Establishing itself as an administrator and commercial steward of his grace. For Luther, Christology is developed from the perspective of redemption. His theology of the cross is a radicalization of the doctrine of incarnation with soteriological intent. Through the lordship of his humanity and flesh, in which we live by faith, he makes us similar to himself and crucifies us, turning unhappy and proud gods into true men, that is, people in their misery and sin. As in Adam we were raised to the likeness of God, so he also descended to the likeness of us, in order to bring us to knowledge about ourselves. This is the meaning of the Incarnation. This is the kingdom of faith, in which Christ reigns, which destroys the divinity we wickedly seek, and returns the despised weakness of the flesh, which we wickedly abandon. It can be said that Luther's Christology is fundamentally soteriology. For him, Jesus Christ is never a theoretical question, but always a practical question. The more concentration on God's redeeming action, the more liberating action of those who believe in Christ. The Augustinian friar is not so interested in what Jesus is, but in what he does and provides. In the work of Christ we discover his person, and not vice versa. It is indisputable that in faith we confess that everything Jesus does is done because he in fact is what he is, that is, God and a human being. But, in fact, our experiential and cognitive access to him occurs through his works and words. Luther is trapped not in the past works, in the life of Jesus, but in the current ones, through which he justifies and renews those who believe in him every day. In short, the sin of humanity is laid upon Christ, his righteousness is bestowed upon us. He dies, we live. Luther's Christology is dynamic and combative, never static and complacent. We observe this aspect precisely when theology focuses on the cross of Christ. The confluence point of the historic and universal battle between evil and good, injustice and justice, curse and blessing, death and life. The crucified Christ, played by Luther, is a fighter for divine love, a rereading of Martin Luther. Finally, we will seek to describe some of Luther's teachings, exposing the perspectives of his theology applying to our current Latin American times, in the sense of making faith an exercise of freedom, Christian love and invitation to transforming service and the gospel of liberation in Jesus Christ is a critical norm and inspiring reference for churches and societies. A theologist WHO thinks from the German people, as Luther opposed the traditional church. Notable divergences gradually emerged about the gospel and the church, as well as about the reforms that should be introduced. In 1520, Luther would expose his conceptions in more detail in writings that are usually classified as reformative. In one of his writings, a thinker organically linked to the people of the base is revealed, who intuits the problems and the way of thinking of the people and the people. Martin Luther was fully aware that he approached church issues from a point of view that was not customary in theological publications of his time and that ran the risk of not being understood by intellectuals. I address a difficult subject that may be impossible to uproot. It is based on the use of centuries and was approved by everyone's consensus.
It took root in such a way that it would be necessary to set aside and modify most of the books currently disseminated and perhaps the entire face of the church and introduce a totally different genre of ceremonies. Or better said, reduce them to their primitive state. But my Christ lives and we must observe the word of God with greater concern than the intelligence of all men and angels. These books disseminated today are basically four works. The Summa Angelica, the Ecclesiastica Hierarchia, the Theologia Mystica, and finally the Rationale Divinorum. Eduardo Horner gives a word about the four in his reflection on Luther. The Summa Angelica de Cassibus Conscienniae, written by Angelus Carlitus, died 1495, was a highly regarded confessor's manual at the time. It addressed questions of conscience in alphabetical order. Luther writes, A book of great fame is widely disseminated, elaborated and mixed with all the dirt and confusion of all human traditions. Her name is Summa Angelica. The Ecclesiastica Hierarchia is a text falsely attributed to Dionysus the Areopagite mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 17, verse 34. The text must be no earlier than the 5th century and probably originating from Syria, and had immense authority in the Middle Ages precisely because of the its alleged author. In it the principle of authority and inequality is deified, which becomes one of the greatest deformations of the Christian spirit. In an expression of rare lucidity, Luther dares to oppose an entire Christian tradition disseminated among the people of his time when he writes, I, to be more daring, completely dislike the fact that so much importance is attributed to this Dionysus whoever he may be, for there is almost nothing in it that is of solid scholarship. The Theologia Mystica, by the same Dionysus Areopagite is analyzed with the same acuteness by Luther. The Theologia Mystica is very pernicious, as it is more Platonizing than Christianizing. The Rationale Divinorum, or Rationale Divinorum Officiorum, by William Durandus Mimetensis, died in 1296, is a book of allegories. Interpreting the ceremonies of the church and its worship in an allegorical way, much to the taste of the people. Luther reacts against such literature. Such writings of allegory are typical of idle men. It is possible to perceive, through the confidence that Luther assumes in front of such authors. The knowledge of what circulated among preachers in contact with the people and not just what circulated in university environments. Luther had the delicacy of being able to observe, in the Christianity of the time, a marked deviation capable of distorting the genuine meaning of the Christian message. The Christian people are, captives, unable to achieve, Christian freedom, because of a sacramental system manipulated by the tyranny of clerics. The writing of the Babylonian captivity deals successively with the various sacraments. Written in Latin, this writing particularly criticized the papacy, this profitable hunt for the Roman bishop, whom he accused of exercising an intolerable tyranny over souls, notably for his doctrine and his practice of the sacraments. Using language already known in the Middle Ages, Luther then talks about the Babylonian captivity of the church. In sacramentalization, Christians become captives of a system within which they cannot live Christian freedom, while those outside this system are considered heretics, subject to condemnation by the church. The administration of the sacraments is in the hands of the clergy, who dictate the orders to be followed by the other part of divided Christianity, the people. We must endure Roman tyranny as if we were imprisoned in Turkey. The fault lies not with the laity, but with the priests. The sacrament is not the property of priests, but of everyone. Priests are not masters but ministers. This analysis of Luther, centered not on doctrine, but on sacramentalization, shows how he is on the same level as an ordinary Christian. How he embodies himself in the lives of the people. Luther revealed, 
through his courageous stance in the face of the clerical system of his time, and abandoned and despised truth among Christians. More than an organized system, Christianity is a ferment, an explosive force within societies, a continuous and uncomfortable reference, to the gospel, to the poor, to the forgotten, to the marginalized, to the oppressed. There will always be attempts to stifle or even erase this force of the spirit that acts in history in favor of the crucified. But there will always be people inspired by the cross of Christ, who think about the people and do things for them in the name of the Crucified One. The Theology of the Cross from the Lives of the People of Latin America To speak of a theology of the cross based on the lives of the people is to see in the history of this crucified people the crucified people of history. The Theology of the Cross converts any and all marginalization of the salvific event to the center of Christian theology. The cross is a very present symbol in the lives of the people and identification with it is found in the most varied forms of suffering and hopes that these people face in their daily lives. When we reread the theology of the cross, from the perspective of the suffering people, we find a suffering God who cares about those who are crucified. We find salvation and deliverance in this wounded God. The theology of the cross is experienced when one is able to transform situations of suffering into hope, to seek transformations, to find strength to continue living despite suffering. On the cross, the question arises acutely about God and, especially, about the relationship between Father and Son. The Christian God is only God in Jesus Christ, God in the Crucified One. Hence Paul's insistence that he does not want to know anything other than Jesus Christ and the crucified Christ. Against his time that is horrified by this God, considered madness and scandal. On the cross the God of Theodicies dies, the omnipotent, the distant. The one of justifications and explanations of the world. But the question is where and who was the God of resurrection on Jesus' cross? If in the resurrection confirms and glorifies the crucified Son, his life, his preaching and his works, then God was already in the abandonment of God that the crucified one experienced. So, talking about the theology of the cross from the people of Latin America is talking about the God who is involved in this abandoned world and marked by the power of death. Just as he was involved in the crucifixion and resurrection, a look from this angle brings the certainty that those crucified today are not abandoned by God. The suffering of the world, which hits men's lives so hard, affects not only the body of Jesus, but the life of the triune God itself. The cross of Christ is for the people the most visible sign that suffering and death can be overcome. Starting from the assumption that Latin America is a continent of crucified people, it is possible to approach a theology of the cross from this reality and it is necessary to maintain the dialectic between God-Jesus world to succumb to the temptation of thinking of God apart from Jesus, our God on the margins of suffering and marginalized society. Based on the theology of the cross in a historically situated reality, the world of oppression, suffering and crucifixion, in which the poor Latin Americans are submerged, it is possible to see that this theology is an instrument of liberation for our present reality. It directs us to an urgent dimension of resistance, of liberation that began in Palestine in the first century, on the cross of Christ itself, and must happen on the cross of all those crucified today, resurrection. Theology is a strong instrument of liberation, not only in the social sphere, but from all forms of oppression. In this context we have the emergence of our own theology here in Latin America that challenges some values of a traditional theology brought with colonization. This theology emerges as a denunciation of any form of oppression. When theology takes a turn to manipulate, it will never be theology of the cross. Delaney states that it is necessary to commit to developing the theology of the cross to recover its critical character that unmasks reality and subjects it to divine judgment.
to also prevent self-pity and masochism. A theology to be truly liberating needs to be authentic in promoting practical reflection. The theology of the cross from a Latin American perspective becomes a sine qua non for thinking and building a different and just world, in relation to the one it is reinvigorating. The rescue of the theology of the cross in its historical, theological salvific dimension, guides everyone towards the horizon of an eschatology already based on history. Through it, the poor, following the example of Christ, cannot remain peaceful in the face of their historical situation on the cross, and more, through the action of God on the cross of the Son. The theme of the cross of the poor, today, indicates the need for liberation, resistance, hope and utopia, for the construction of a world transformed into a kingdom of God. Vision of Liberation Theology from Lutheran Theology we have already seen the importance of the theme of freedom in the prelude about the Babylonian captivity of the church written by Martin Luther. This last point starts from the assumption that freedom and liberation have something to do with each other. This booklet, dedicated to Pope Leo X, somehow summarizes everything that Luther intended to affirm regarding the subject of Christian faith, love and freedom. Without a doubt, it is one of the Reformer's fundamental treatises. In his writing, Liberation Theology, from 1972, almost 450 years after the publication of On Christian Freedom, Gutierrez, initiating the publications of Liberation Theology, places liberation as a central category of Christian reflection, just as Luther places his writing at the center of his speech, according to Wilfred Grohl, Lutheran theologian. At all times, human beings have always been in search of freedom, true freedom. Freedom, found in Christ trapped on the tree, who paradoxically offers us full freedom, enabling us to be agents of liberation. In the last part of his book on Christian liberty, Luther writes, it can be deduced from all this that the Christian does not live in himself, but in Christ and his neighbors. In Christ, through faith, and in others, through love, by faith he rises above himself to God. Departing from God he bows beneath himself through love, but always remains in God and in divine love. As Jesus says, from now on you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is true, spiritual and Christian freedom, which frees the heart from every sin, commandment and law. It is freedom that surpasses all other freedoms, just as the heavens surpass the earth. May God make us understand this freedom correctly and preserve it. Amen. If we pay close attention to these statements by Luther regarding the ecstatic existence of the Christian, we will see that. As a human person, whoever is in God is truly free. A first question arises, how is someone in God? Everyone who rises in faith in God is in God. He is in God remaining in God even as he turns from God to his neighbor. The second question is, how can a person know that he is truly free in God? The answer to this question is, through faith in Christ. Continuing with one more question. How does faith in Christ arise in a person? Luther's answer is that faith arises from knowing Christ. Since faith becomes faith in Christ not in itself, but through Christ. It is necessary for this person to obtain knowledge about Christ, for the emergence of their faith, through the Bible. Lutheran theology managed to think about the constitution of human freedom in such a way that the human person is free and can know this, in the midst of his situation in the world. Wilfred Grohl states that, in the Lutheran understanding, the freedom granted by God excludes the person who received it from acting as if he still needed to earn it, secure it or consume it through his actions. These attempts would be contradicting the fact that freedom is already constituted, in Christ, exclusively by grace through faith. Therefore, for Luther, all human action cannot constitute this freedom, but must start from it. Luther intended to emphasize, firstly, that Christian freedom, that of the inner person or the soul,
is not dependent on external contingencies such as holiness, material well-being or even this or that type of action. Luther, also, in this prelude, starts with an idea of freedom not only of the soul, but also of the body. In other words, there is not just faith or the inner human being. On the contrary, until the last day we live in the flesh, which Luther actually understands in a double sense. There is, on the one hand, what in the human being, in particular through his body, opposes the new life. On the other hand, there are relationships with others. Martin Ho emphasizes that faith must be at the origin of works, otherwise they are not good, and we share everything with everyone in this world. From freedom to service, the Christian is a free lord over everything, subject to no one. The Christian is a most official servant of everything, subject to everyone. One lives not only for oneself in this mortal body, to operate in it, but also for all people on earth. He subjects his body to this, so he can serve others with more sincerity and freedom. Therefore it cannot happen that she is idle in this life and without work in favor of her neighbors. For it is necessary that he speak to people, act and deal with them, just as Christ, made in the likeness of a human person, was found in appearance as a human person, and involved himself with people. Luther ends his thought by saying that it is necessary, however, to avoid giving works a virtue of justification. In fact, through faith in Christ we are not free from works, but from the false concept of works, that is, from the foolish presumption of a justification achieved by works. In his treatise on Christian freedom of 1520, the reformer Matinho Luther outlines his concept of freedom in two directions. One in the relationship between the human being and God, in which the human being becomes free through the free action of God that grants him freedom, justification by grace through faith. Another in the relationship with his fellow man, which becomes characterized by disinterested service. The Christian person who in faith is free and is not subject to anyone. In love is a servant of all other people and is subject to them. This servitude in love is the concrete exercise of free liberation obtained by grace in faith. Both freedom and servitude as an expression of freedom are unrestricted total and potentially universal, universal priesthood, albeit of believers. The concept of liberation, used as a hermeneutic axis by Latin American liberation theology, is, on the one hand, according to Altman 85 heir of the reform, there is a frequent allusion among liberation theologians to the gratuitousness of God's action, based on an expression of freedom. On the other hand, there is an undeniable influence of the Hegelian conception of history, in particular of the Hegelian left, especially K. Marx, when reflecting the historical condition of human liberation. This means, on the one hand, that the notion of measurements for divine action itself is deepened and expanded, within history, through historical agents, and, on the other hand, as the other side of the coin, the historical commitment of beings is emphasized. Humans in general and Christian people in particular with liberation as a process. Both concepts of freedom and history are incorporated in the concept of liberation in a Hegelian sense of overcoming, that is, through the positive incorporation of these concepts with their concomitant elevation to a higher stage. In summary, liberation theology places its emphasis on three aspects, all of which cannot be renounced. 1. The human being as a social being incorporates individual values into the community and collective reality. 2. The historical dimension that takes shape in concrete mediations. 3. Liberation not just as an event, but as a process. Analyzing both freedom in Luther and liberation theology. It is possible to observe that in liberation theology it clearly encompasses social freedom, which Luther legitimately considered a result of freedom, but when elevated to a religious program.
a falsification of true freedom Christian. An approximation of divergent conceptions can perhaps be obtained if we consider that divine action, grace, and human action, effective faith. Certainly better. Love, in concrete reality do not necessarily follow each other chronologically, but rather in a dynamic process continuous. I.e. Grace evokes the response of faith and the experience of love, which, in turn, can be a concrete representation, historical mediation, of grace for other people, which evokes a new manifestation of faith and love, and so on. Exactly as a good tree bears good fruit, freedom is understood as inevitably leading to liberation, which has already occurred and will always occur again. Following the example of Christ, what is liberating in him is not exactly the cross, nor the blood, nor death, taken in themselves. But it is your attitude of love, of surrender, of forgiveness and grace. Now, Jesus' entire existence was a pro-existence, a service to others. Jesus' cross is not an isolated and contingently tragic event within the global context of his life. It is rather the final fruit and the total expression of a life he loved. Conclusion. The formation of Luther's theological concept did not fall from the sky, or was not found in a library overnight. However, it was formed in a historical political cultural context. It began in the face of several historical factors such as the decline of the church at the end of the Middle Ages, the new movements of the Renaissance and humanism, the uneasy coexistence of territories and empire, social changes, religious problems, etc. The facts about his childhood and youth, albeit not decisive and determinant to understand the process of formation of Luther Mann and his ideas, helps in understanding his way of thinking about God. Martin Luther's theological views were always of existential significance from his own personal life. That is, his theology was made from answers he received to existential problems. His vast literary production, including cross theology, was not the result of preconceived thinking, but was developed with his feet on the ground, dusty feet, experiencing his days and in the face of the multiple controversies in which he was involved. Theology is not reduced to a repetition of syntheses of universal doctrines, nor a simple communication of objective truths. It develops through the meaning questions seeing that each case is a different, specific case. Friar Augustinian's theology has become constructive and socially relevant because it is moving with human history, understanding and fitting into the social context. Luther's new theology will no longer reflect on God's being. Theology is revelation. That is, God cannot be the object of human discourse, for God is not an object of experience. As are the objects of the world, subject to understanding, definitions, and dominations by human intelligence. God is taken as subject and not as a mere object of research. Luther's theological discourse on God is only possible because of God's own discourse. God presents himself to man and not the man who chooses the place of finding God. In his theology God reveals himself on the cross in Christ. To speak of God is to speak of the crucified. It is realizing that the knowledge of God in the crucified takes the interests of the human being seriously. For Luther Christology is developed from the perspective of human redemption. His theology of the cross is a radicalization of the doctrine of incarnation with soteriological intention. For the reformer, the knowledge of God is hidden in his revelation and his goodness reveals himself in the martyrdom of the cross. The theology of the cross makes the creature hope to contemplate non-apparent things. It makes the creature hope that God meets the crucified. The development of Luther's cross theology was a program of critical and reformer theology. The theology of the cross is not a chapter of theology, but the foreshadowing of all Christian theology. It is a specific type of theology. It is the perspective center of all theological manifestations that want to be Christian.
It is from there that comes the task of contextualizing the theology of the cross as a form of criticism and reform for Latin America. Just as Martin Luther applied to his reality, it is necessary today to unfold the theology of the cross in understanding the world and history, and develop a cross-reform theology not only the churches, but together with a liberating practice for the miserable and its dominators, also society. Cross theology only remains theology of the cross in the context of critical liberating practice in proclamation of life. She needs to be intended to free humanity from her inhuman definitions. The death of Jesus Christ, the crucified, is the result of a liberating proclamation. Jesus was sacrificed with death, because by the incarnation he became fully human and assumed the human being within a determined historical situation facing each situation in the favos of the crucified of history. This true theology shows that God not only participates in our pain, but converts our pain into his pain and introduces our death into his life. Who, in the passion of the world, suffers without reason, judging himself abandoned by God, and in the midst of this pain cries for God, coincides fundamentally with the cry of Jesus on the cross. And God will no longer be the hidden face to him to scream, but it will be the God who screams with him and him. The man who suffers thus feels in the situation of God. The crucified God of Jesus does not lead us to despise what suffers, nor does it lead us to mask the pain of the world. Finally we came to the conclusion that Luther's cross in Latin American perspective critically develops a mass of humanity that usually shows an incredible ability to turn their backs to those who suffer, ignoring pain situations, or judging suffering as those who goes through a just punishment. This theology points to the cross, showing that we find in Christ the model of a liberator, man-God who identifies himself with the people. Therefore, the cross and death of Jesus, like that of so many who identify with him as crucified, is a consequence of the effort to take the cross off the shoulders of the sufferers. It was the thesis that generated us in this work. Learn a little more about Martin Ho Luther by clicking on the links that are described in the video.